uh, for my political science degree, we have like the capstone class, you know, mm -hmm. and this one's focused on like personhood and citizenship. So I kind of wanted to sort of take that concept from the Native American perspective, you know? Yeah. I um, so uh, I guess like the first question I really want to ask is like, is there a Potawatomi word for citizenship or for citizen, I should say? Uh, I mean, there's a there's a word for a person, not necessarily um, a citizen per se. Like we have a word, um, nodzawin, which is kind of like the way that we do things, the way that we live our lives, the way that we do. I mean, so you, I mean, I would say the closest thing to really a citizen would be like you know, nishnabe, nishnabe, plural, um, our original word for ourselves. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so then I guess the next would be, um, how would we then distinguish ourselves from other, like other tribes, like other people groups? Uh, a lot of times when we introduce ourselves, you know, we'll say, you know, we'll say Nishnabendao. And today Nishnabe kind of means more general, like Indian in a way. Mm -hmm. And then we'll say Bodewad Mindao, you know, like I'm Potawatomi. So I'm Indian and I'm Potawatomi, Bodewad Mindao. Yeah. Okay. And then, like for other people, and then, and then even beyond that, a lot of times we'll also say like, you know, Shishibaniak Nidabendagwis, which means I'm enrolled citizen Potawatomi because you know there are seven groups of federally recognized uh, Potawatomi tribes in the United States, two in Canada, um, and then some people will also give their clan. That's like a, yet another breakup of of how they where they fit, if you will, and that okay. probably will go into what we you were talking about about earlier kind of systems and things like that, but. Like I'll say, Jijok and Dodam, I'm Crane Clan. Okay, so it would be kind of like uh, like people saying that they're like a California citizen or an Oklahoma citizen, rather than like, you know, like you're a citizen of your clan more than necessarily a citizen of the tribe as a whole. No, I, I would say you're still a, a member of the tribe as a whole. The clan system is kind of um, it's kind of dissipated in kind of its role within the tribe uh, in the last few hundred years mainly after we kind of became acculturated and whatnot and took on kind of, you know, American ways, if you will, uh, the clan lost some of its function and duties. I mean, old school at villages and things like that would be a lot of times, I guess with the clan, when you look at the larger Potawatomi like nation, if you think of like all Potawatomi people back in the day, you had little, you had different villages that were kind of maybe this clan would be over here. This clan would live over here. This clan would live over here. And they would come together for larger events, maybe for summer events or for ceremonies and things like that. But they kind of lived in their own little section by themselves, um, in a way, kind of like their own communities, like you were saying, like almost your own cities. Today, not so much in the sense of, you know, mainly because people don't know their clans. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you have a lot more mixture of different original clans um, down in Oklahoma, for example, you have people that are Thunder Clan or Bear Clan or Crane Clan. It's not like if you live in Shawnee, you know, you're Crane Clan or you live in, you know, Tecumseh, you're, it's not like that anymore. Okay. So like that, that sort of, uh, that differentiated group is not really geographic anymore. It's just a not little anymore. bit of cultural. No, not okay. anymore. It's, 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 it's more memorial in a way, if you think of it, because technically the clan system, the way it's supposed to go is it's supposed to follow your father's family. So like if it would be like whatever my dad's clan was, then my grandpa's clan. But for myself, for example, you know, my mom is the Potawatomi, my grandma is the Potawatomi, then my great grandpa was the Potawatomi. So <clears throat> for me, it's more like it's today people a lot of times just remember, remember what that clan was, mm -hmm. you know, and they claim that clan kind of as their own. But because um, like I said, technically, if there's a break in that line, you wouldn't be of that clan anymore. People that didn't have a clan, they either had no clan and, and for most of our people down here in Oklahoma, a lot of our folks married in with French fur traders and things like that. You have a lot of French last names like, you know, Bourbonnais or Bursa or Peltier or Navarre. You have all these French French men that married Potomac women. So technically at that point right there, the clan would be over. Oh, that's the point actually that person married in. But what a lot of times, like I said, what people will do is they'll trace back to an original name and sometimes it's easy to figure out sometimes it's not like if your great 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 grandmother was you know little bear woman well there's a good chance that you're probably bear clan yeah. if you're you know if you go back to like you know thundercloud or something like that well you're probably thunder clan but some of them are a little more complicated because they're not necessarily real they're they might be names that describe like 
a, a certain or describe a story. There might be something they got from like when they were in war. Oh, uh, like Wabansi means uh, he walks in the morning, but there's actually a story about that. He actually went into an enemy village and he grabbed some captives and he brought them out. And that's why they gave him that name. But if you didn't know that story, that background, you wouldn't know what it necessarily is talking about sometimes. Mm. Another good example would be Chabonet. Chabonet was a, he's Bear Clan, but we only know that because we know the story behind it. Well, it's, it's talking about, literally, it's talking about the way a bear claws through something. So oh. If you didn't know the background to it, you might think, well, it could be a badger, it could be a bear, it could be a chipmunk. I mean, I don't know, whatever you think of that could claw through something, you know? And so, or like you might have a name in your family, like Afternoon Woman. Well, what does that mean? I mean yeah. I, I don't know. So that's a long explanation. Sorry. Oh, it's all right. That, that actually, that kind of adds like, a, a, I kind of want to go back to an earlier thing you said about how like, French men would end up joining the uh, tribe. Was yeah. there sort of like a formal process of like inclusion into the tribe? Like, would they be considered like citizens the same way a Potawatomi man would be, or was it just sort of? I I, I would say yes and no, uh, in the sense of they definitely married Potawatomi women for the connections that they received from that. I mean, I'm not saying that all of them didn't like have fine love or whatever, but. They definitely, you know, it definitely served a purpose for them that if they married somebody who was, you know, the daughter of this prominent head man or this prominent head man, they're going to have an in with that village or this group of people. They're going to have trading partners. So it's about relationships and, and connections in that way. The same way that, you know, even into, you know, early American history, you know, the Rockefellers were married in with the, the Morgans who married, in, you know. Well, um, that's, the, that's just super common in history is marriage for oh, connection. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for connections. Now, whether they had a true role in a leadership type format, um, it kind of varied kind of person to person. I mean, certain people, a lot of times you had a lot of these French guys that maybe they spoke Potawatomi too, because obviously they met their wife. So they knew Potawatomi, they knew English, or they knew French. They might even know English. I mean, some of them did, you know, so they, and they knew the, the Chumokman or the white man's world, if you will. So they might be seen as somebody like, hey, I'll have my son-in-law negotiate on behalf of me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like they weren't necessarily the leader, but maybe, maybe they were being asked to talk on behalf of a different person who was in fact the leader. The thing about the dichotomy or the, or the breakup of like leadership is kind of confusing to a lot of people too, because when the Americans came in contact with us and the French, they really were looking for that one person that could kind of decide everything. Like, this guy is the head of all the Potawatomi's and he can just sign this and that's what it is. But because of the way the structure was, how there was this village over this village over this village over here, you didn't have just one leader that truly had a say over the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then you also had something happen where you had like, a lot of times the government would try to force people into that kind of position saying, oh, this person can talk for everybody. Let's do that. But so a lot of times on trees, you'd see like a hundred different people's signatures. <laughs> Yeah, because every single one of those people were required or they weren't leaving, you know, because that might person might be kind of the one that's talking for this group of 20 people that's talking for this 30 people, this 50 people, this 40 people. So, OK, well, you didn't get that. Those three guys signatures. Well, they're not going to leave now. So, yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, uh, I don't know if that answered your question or just confused it. But. No, that actually did quite a bit because it, it kind of brought into like a, a another idea because like <clears throat> citizenship in a lot of ways is connected to the concept of like a nation. You know, like mm -hmm. one unifying nation so that idea that we weren't necessarily the one unifying nation in the we like we were a unified people yes but not necessarily like one solid political body where mm -hmm. you we could all point to just like that one dude we all voted for him it was more this group voted for this one guy to represent them and then and and the other thing is that that sometimes that changed too depending on the situation you might have one guy that talks for your for your village or your group of people during war, for example. Maybe he's a great warrior. You want that guy in on what's going to happen. This other guy, he's more of a peacetime guy that knows how to, you know, navigate and make deals and get everybody yeah. to work with. You might have another guy who knows how to deal with, you know, trade or business, and he's kind of the one we're going to send for that. So it wasn't like – the other thing about it is it wasn't like a hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm. The government liked that idea, too. They liked the idea because they were used to, you know, 
not the, when I say the government, the, you know, the French and the English, they were used to monarchies and this is nobility and this, that's where like the concept, you know, king, princess, things like that. But it wasn't really like that. I mean, Potteromi saw you for who you were because your dad's a great leader doesn't mean you might, or a great hunter doesn't mean you're a great hunter, you know, because your dad is a, a great negotiator doesn't mean you might be an idiot. And they're not going to send you in there just because that's your daddy. They don't care. I mean, we're not going to be dumb like that. You either, you, I mean, not to say that sometimes kids of people didn't make that, make that jump, but it was really on their own merits, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. That's well, And that, so, so the concept of like own merits, like, was there sort of, could, could you point to like some specific, like personal responsibilities that we would have had in that traditional context? Like, if you wanted to be accepted as a member of the village or the tribe, did you have, like, personal responsibilities and obligations? You'd Absolutely. Have uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, certain clans had even certain responsibilities, like the Crane clan, the Loon clan were kind of seen as kind of a, a leadership clans. Uh, the Bear clan were seen as people that were uh, the police of the tribe, and they kind of, they also, a lot of them were medicine people. A lot of times, Bear clan people would kind of set up on the outskirts of maybe a larger gathering to kind of keep everybody safe and kind of keep everybody like, you know, acting right, I guess. So there were definitely like roles like a bear. Uh, <laughs> and because of that, because they spent a lot of time kind of off a little bit from the bills, they also saw, you know, animals and how they reacted to different things. And they learned medicines from watching those animals. You know, if the animal hurts itself, how does it take care of it? Well, it rubs itself on this one plant over, huh, that would probably work if we got burned in a similar way, you know, so they picked up those kind of things and then kind of pass those down through the, the generations. And so, yeah, different clans definitely had certain duties and roles within the larger Potawatomi uh, nation, I guess. Now today, you know, the way it is, because, you know, we have these different unique nations, if you will, you know, we have the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, the Prairie Band Nation, the Pokagon Potawatomi Nation. In a sense, you know, today it's a little different because, you know, we have, we are, we are part of a larger Potawatomi group, but our, our interests lie with our particular group, you know, who we're enrolled with, because just because I can be enrolled down here doesn't mean it's not cross around. It's not, it's not the same system. Yeah. It's not like I can walk up, let's say I moved to Kansas and go to Kansas and say, well, I'm going to enroll over here. They're like, well, no, you're not because your dad wasn't enrolled or, or, or depend on, and, and every group has different ways they do membership. I mean, some of them are, are blood quantum where you have to be a fourth uh, Potawatomi. There's some that, uh, Hannibal Potomies, they do it with, you have to be half Potomami or you have to have, they can also adopt people into the tribe. They allow that with their particular mm -hmm. way their system works. Uh, but every group's a little different. Pokagon, I believe, is a descendancy tribe like we are. Um, and then other ones have done it where they're descendancy, but then they cut off, they cut, they, they close their roles sometimes too. Mm -hmm. so like they might be a descendancy tribe, but they've decided that, you know, we're, we've, maxed out on the amount we want enrolled at this moment you're now no longer open to being enrolled right now and then they'll they would open it from time to time and let people that are members know then they could go and they could get enrolled but that limits the amount of non-members that just kind of show up out of the woodwork and say hey i want to be enrolled because they didn't even know it was coming so yeah well that that kind of like that idea of very like exclusive citizenship in the modern context would you say that would have also like kind of applied in the previous one or would have like in the traditional one, or if like somebody showed up at the village and was totally willing to do whatever it took to be part of it, would they have been accepted? I think so. I, I, I think that that's more of a modern component and it's partly like blood quantum stuff. That's the government's, uh, you know, attempt to really destroy native tribes because eventually you can get it to where you can breed everybody out. I mean, if, if you marry, cause it doesn't take very long. I mean, I, you know, like if you're a full blood Potawatomi, you marry a whatever, a, a, a American, non native person, your kids are already, bam, they're half. And the next generation, they're a fourth. And if you cut off at a fourth, the next generation is out. Now, if you weren't even a full Potawatomi, maybe you were like, like I know a guy who's um, like 14 16th Potawatomi. Or thir uh, no, 13 16th Potawatomi. He's, he's told me he's 1 16th Menominee, 1 16th Winnebago, 1 16th French. So, but even that 1 16th amount, each generation, so his kids would be a little less than half. His next generation would be a little less than a fourth, and in some groups that wouldn't be en enrollable. 
So he yeah. could watch his own grandkids not be able to be enrolled. So wow. uh, that fast. So it can, or you marry outside, you marry other native people. Maybe you marry somebody who's a different tribe. You're still marrying a native, but you're not marrying a Potawatomi. Like Prairie Band, they, the way they do it, they, you have to be one fourth Prairie Band Potawatomi blood. They don't even count other Potawatomi blood. <laughs> so oh, you can wow. have like, and the, the, the problem with that is a lot of Prairie Bands are also citizen Potawatomi. They're, because we both came down to Kansas at the same time, we intermarried. Some of our people from who went down to Oklahoma came back up to Kansas, remarried in there. So they may not even count that Potawatomi blood that's citizen Potawatomi. So your kid might be off the rolls from that. But I really think it's more about money when it comes to cutting it off like that. I mean, you got two ways of looking at it. You can bulk your numbers up and then you actually are eligible for more aid from the government. So like the government does it based on population numbers. So if they're giving out a certain amount, two groups, they would base it off population. So you can get like maybe more IHS, which is Indian Health Services, maybe funding that way. Or you could limit it, and that, that way if you had like uh, money coming in from casinos and you wanted to per cap it out, that's one reason for limiting blood quantum. So I, I would say it's definitely a modern thing. I would say in the past, if you came into a village, you're either going to be accepted or you're not. I mean, if, and they would talk a lot of times about a lot of these Frenchmen living as Potawatomis. I mean, you're either going to, you're either coming into the village and you're going to move in with your you know, wife's family and their wigwam, or you plan on taking your wife outside of there and going and moving out to a cabin. But either way, you're still going to have constant interactions. I mean, you're, you got, and the same way that you have these relationships you've formed with people by marrying that, that woman, you know, you have her parents and whatnot. You also have cousins and other relatives that way that you're going to have a connection to. And, you know, they used to talk about like adopting people in the tribe back in the day. Um, so I don't think, and the other thing is you also had groups that weren't even Potawatomi that ended up into the tribe. You have a lot of people that have heritage that might be Menominee or Kickapoo or other Algonquian tribes in the area. Same kind of reasons that people would marry in with the French for connections. People also married in with other tribes. So you might have a wife who's Odawa, you know, you're Potawatomi. So your kids are part Potawatomi, part Odawa. And then next generation down, some of them might marry, one of them might marry you know, a Kickapoo leader. So you're cementing kind of your, your relationships there with other tribes. Um, so you have a lot of that. It wasn't as precise as maybe people would like to imagine, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and, and blood quantum in, in general is really confusing because when they started deciding to, to, to quantify it, I guess, a lot of times they did it after the fact, like, you know, like in the 1800s where people have been intermarried for 200 years. So, and they would base it on just like taking a look at somebody like, so you and your brother, your brother went out and he spent a lot of time outdoors. Maybe you hung back and didn't get as much sunlight that summer. Your brother looks darker. He's a half, you're a fourth. And so sometimes they'd assign a, a, a random blood quantum of people that were the same biological level, a different number. So yeah. it's really kind of a, the Menominees actually did something really interesting a long time ago. What um, I was told about like in the thirties or forties, their blood quantum was all whacked out. Like people were like this and that. They basically were like, look, anybody living on the Menominee Reservation as of today, 1940, you're a full-blood Menominee. And that's how we're going to count you from here on out. And the amusing thing about it, that is there were some people that were Potawatomis, that were Potawatomi and Menominee living on that reservation that were then counted as full Menominee. But they knew for a fact they were like half Potawatomi, half this, you know. But they were like, look, we're not going to jack with it. We have the right as a sovereign nation to determine how we want to do with things. So that's what we're going to do. And in a way, that's kind of what our tribe has done to a degree. I mean, they've never said that everybody's a full-blood Potawatomi, but they've basically said that, you know, blood quantum is not a deciding factor on whether you're part of our tribe. You have to have an ancestor that was on the rolls, and it has to be in a straight line. So, like, if my mom wasn't on the rolls, I couldn't be on the rolls. But since my mom was on the rolls, and I'm, I can be on the rolls, since I'm on the rolls, my kids can be on the rolls, and it just kind of goes down like that. But, you know, again, that's, that's the ability of a nation to decide how it wants to um, see that, I guess. That's so a really long answer. Well, no, I, that actually, that, that, that actual, that last part actually kind of leads to this sort of like idea that I was sort of thinking of, like, since we are a sovereign nation and we can decide who is and who is not Potawatomi, essentially, we could incorporate people into the tribe who aren't necessarily Potawatomi then. 
to some degree, like similarly to how we would have done it, like let's say in a traditional time frame where let's say if we wanted, yeah, if we wanted to, I mean, we could make a law and we could change the constitution and we could do that. I can tell you that the Hanneville Potawatomis, for example, I'll just give you an example. They're not us, but they're another group of Potawatomis. They, the way their, their deal works, the reason I understand some about that is I worked for the Hanneville Potawatomis for a couple of years in their K through 12 school. So I lived in that community. I knew a lot about, in fact, I had some of them tell me they would adopt me into their tribe. <laughs> but uh, that's the thing that they have going on is basically the way it works is if you're half Potawatomi, a lot of those people were full and half, they were higher blood quantums up there. If you were half Potawatomi, you were automatically enrolled. If you were less than half, but you were born on their reservation, you were enrolled. If you were less than half, but not born on your reservation, you had to be adopted into the tribe. So you had to take like an ad out in the paper and explain like that my grandpa is so and so and so and so. And there's and the only people that could vote were the ones that live on the reservation. So there's about 900, I think, trial members, but only about 130 that live on the reservation that were voting age, basically. So those 130 people then decide if you are allowed to become part of the tribe. Now, the, the confusing thing about that or the difficult thing is, I, and I saw a lot of the kids that went to the school there that had to struggle with this, where they were born somewhere else and they moved back to Hanneville and then they, they did join the, the tribal school uh, and they, they, would, they would take an ad out in the paper and say, I want to be a part of the tribe. I saw situations where the sister would get adopted and the brother wouldn't or vice versa. This one brother, for example, was uh, a boxer and was real uh, well known in the community. And he was a gold glove boxer. And for whatever reason, the people that could vote voted him in, didn't vote the sister. So that's, yeah. <clears throat> that's the thing about the adoption uh, from one perspective, at least. So, I mean, the tribe can decide however it wants, but, um, and it, it kind of gets confusing sometimes. I mean, I'll give you, I mean, for some people, I've heard people talk online before about the idea of adoptions. And I heard this one lady say on one of the Facebook, like says in Palmy Group, something about, well, I've been married to a Palmy 35 years and I have you know, three kids. Can I be a part of the tribe? Well, no, you can't. <clears throat> I mean, that's just not the way it works. That's not the way our rules are set up. You can't do that. And it comes down to the fact that you don't have this common blood. And the thing about that that, that gets real murky too is, um, then you have people that say, well, I was, you know, I have kids that are adopted. I also have a child that, that I've adopted. Now he happens to be from another tribe. His mom, he was, but when, when I met his mother, uh, he was three months old and his father had passed away. So his dad's not even in the picture, but he's enrolled Seminole. Um, but the thing about that is, you know, I have adopted him since then. You know, he's my son for all great things. He knows part of my language. I'm the only dad he's ever known. But the confusing thing about that is if we go to the festival right now, they'll put on the thing, they'll put guest, which is really kind of a little bit disconcerting to me because I'm like, he doesn't even know that I'm not his dad. But I, I'm, I'm going to be really unhappy if eventually the reason he finds out is because I've taken him to the festival and they put guest on there. He's like, why am I a guest? And everybody else is from you know, descendant of so-and-so. Like, what the crud, you know? <laughs> Can't just put whatever I want on there, you know? So I basically you're not the one that outs the fact that you're not my boss. Like I can tell him when I want to tell him kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's, that's, and that's kind of what the other person was arguing too, is their whole thing was they wanted to just be able to be a part of the, the bigger community as a whole. Like they have meetings and things. So let's say their spouse passes away. Can they still go to the meetings? Well, right now, the way it works, you could go if you're a guest and that's what Kellen has to go as Kellen has to go to the festival as my guest or one of his sister's guests. But the other five kids in my house are all enrolled Potawatomi, you know, but he's not. So he has to go as a guest. And my wife, she's, she's a Creek in Seminole. She's enrolled Creek, but um, you know, so it gets a little, it does get complicated like that. Um, the other thing that gets complicated is when you have multiple nationalities, like I've, my kids are Creek, like my youngest kids are Creek, Potawatomi and Seminole. But the way the U S government works is they cannot, be recognized by all of those groups. They have to pick one and enroll them, which in a way you think about it, it's kind of unfair because I mean, they they are of all those people, you know, and if, if one group per se offers something that might be like Seminoles offer a clothing allowance, they've always offered. But the, our tribe hasn't offered that except they've done during the COVID time, but they hadn't the, previously didn't have a clothing allowance for kids. But they, my kids that enrolled pot on me couldn't get that because they enrolled pot on me and vice versa. They couldn't get a scholarship with our tribe. And that's where, and that's, I think, where the nationhood really comes into play is 
that people don't understand, it, it really comes down to blood. It comes down to what I say about, you know, when we talk about a nation and you know, it's our blood, it's our common history, it's our traditions, our ceremonies, um, our dance, our food. And then our, and our language is kind of the key that ties it all together. And that's one thing that w differentiates people. When you meet somebody who's a, a native person, a lot of times what they would say is, and what, what particular way do you speak, you know, in, in a way that your language is kind of your descriptor into who you are. To, versus you're, a, you're an Ojibwe, or you're an Odawa, you're an Anami, you're a Potawatomi, in a way because of the way you speak. So the language is something that kind of ties us all together as a people. But, um, and the thing I t would say to somebody who, you know, wishes they could be a part of the tribe as like a spouse that's not native. Now the benefit there would be that they could get like IHS, Indian Health Services, things like that. Or if there ever was a day that we gave out a per cap, they could get it. But the negative side of it would be like, and we had people that in the past were able to get on our roles that weren't even Potawatomi, and then they would be on the roles in the next generation. So like, let's say the wife divorces the husband. She's been enrolled in our tribe. Unless we put something in there that said, as soon as you divorce your husband or spouse, you're no longer part of our tribe, then she could then turn around, remarry, have a whole other set of kids and enroll them all in our tribe. Before you know it, there wouldn't be anybody left in our tribe with Potawatomi. And then they would be like, well, where's my this? Where's my that? And they're like, can't you care about the tribe? Why should I care about the tribe? I'm not even Potawatomi. I know it. So that's kind of the, the thing that makes it complicated with the idea of adoption is that eventually if you adopt enough people into your tribe, they won't be Potawatomi. They'll have no sense of, of identity in being Potawatomi. Not that I'm not saying that everybody that's Potawatomi has a sense of identity, <laughs> but uh, still they have no real common tied to the tribe other than what the tribe can give them. Now that group in Hannibal, I will say that they had a really unique situation. They had a lady up, now remember I told you they have to adopt each person that's under a half. Well, there was a lady who lived on the reservation for a number of years. I think she worked for the tribe. She was a Japanese lady. They actually adopted her into the tribe. And because they adopted her again, she could use IHS, but it was a by basis thing. So Maybe if there was a way you could do that where it would be a by basis, like that way that couldn't be um, used in a negative way. Maybe that could work one day if people really wanted it to, but it really comes down to the same concept. I think everybody out there thinks that eventually we're going to get that magical check that everyone else thinks everyone, everybody thinks everybody's getting. Anybody you meet anywhere thinks, oh, you're Indian. You must get a check in the mail. I don't get a check for anything. I don't know what you're talking about. I pay taxes, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The only check I'm getting for my tribe is because I happen to work for my tribe, but that's it, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of people, they think that just because you're Indian, because they know of other tribes that get this per cap payment or, or, or which is in a way is a payment based on profits, like from their casinos and things like that. Um, but yeah. Well, speaking of like, since we were kind of talking about like the benefits of citizenship, because like the Indian healthcare, the, the potential yeah. checks or whatever benefits, whatever the things that, like how how we were talking about earlier about how there were inherent like responsibilities and things that like a person had to do to be a member of the tribe like this is sort of kind of like the last question so i can let you go but um are there anything that you would like to see that like would be that same type of like obligation that a person would have to be considered a member of the tribe yes <laughs> uh I would definitely like to see something like that person. I mean, like, especially if you've been removed from your tribe for a long time, I feel like it's, it would be beneficial if people had to do a citizenship test. We're like, because basically as soon as you become a member of the tribe, in a way you're kind of speaking on, you can almost speak on behalf of the tribe saying, Hey, I'm citizen Potawatomi. This is how I feel. Therefore, this is how it is. We lived in, you know, that you could be like, well, we lived in teepees and we hunted Buffalo. No, no, no. We didn't do all that. So you have a lot of people out there that don't know the first thing about their history, their culture, their language. And I think that especially if they haven't been connected to the tribe in a very long time, like, like maybe they've been living in California. I, I've heard of three generations getting enrolled at the same time. Like basically the grandma got enrolled and then the kid got enrolled and the, and the grandchild got enrolled. But because of that large gap, a lot of times those people might have not had a real connection to the tribe. They might not, know a lot about the tribe, might not know, know a lot of the history. Now, I do think that we should make something available that then they could use to further that knowledge, but I think it would be a nice thing 
to to have people you know you know at least know we're from the great lakes you know know that we're algonquin speaking people that we didn't chase buffaloes that we that we ate fish you know we had canoes you know at least know some of those basic historical facts about us and i'm personally being a language guy i think it'd be great if people would just because in reality our language really is who makes us who we are because when we don't have a language anymore it's one of the determining factors of sovereignty with the federal government does you know when they look at a tribe and they say are you a unique people you know do you have your own language tradition da, da, da. but language is really one that they that they key in on because they know that a lot of tribes are losing their languages there's not a lot of people left that speak you know their tribal language whether it be Potawatomi or Kickapoo or whatever and so that is something that is inherent to who we are as necessary definitely from who we are as a people but also because we think of the language as a gift something that was given to us by the creator that this is something special and unique that makes us a unique people this language that was given to us so it's important that our language continues and goes on so it would be nice if people had to take like a a beginner Potawatomi class you know it doesn't have to be and they don't have to like ace it or something or whatever but it doesn't have to be overly hard it could just be learning you know like a few commands a few words and then giving them the possibility if they want to learn more obviously they could continue forward but at least to to force them to at least consider it or take into account because the language changes the way you see the world the way that our when you the language is kind of like a portal in a sense where you can see what was important to our ancestors and what continues to be important to us as as Potawatomi people because language shifts the way that you see the world around you. I mean, people know that, you know, from time, anytime you learn a language, it changes kind of the way that you see things. And in a way it makes you a better person for that, in, in my opinion. But um, so, yeah, I think definitely a, a learning the language or some kind of citizenship test, especially, like I said, if you've been removed for a long time. Now, if you grew up in your tribe, but even if you grew up in your tribe, I, I don't see the, the ill of having to do that. If you grew up in your tribe, you should already know the answer. Then if you've been around it, you should at least, and it, it doesn't have to be one of those things where like pass fail and you only get one shot I and mean, you should theoretically be able to come back and take it as many times as you can until you get in unless just in case i mean you have like a learning disability or whatever i mean you know what i mean and there should be ways that we can make exceptions you know for people if they have like severe learning disability or something like that where we can say you know this person you know had a brain trauma or something like that and they can't even remember yesterday or what they had for lunch this afternoon there's no way they can remember that you know, we can make an exception, I would think, you know. But, yeah. But that's my opinion. Now, I will say that's my opinion, and that may not be the, <laughs> the uh, that's not the tribe's opinion. I want to yeah. make, make sure that I'm clear to say that, because that's purely speaking from my own personal opinion of things. Yeah, that, that, that was really, like, seeing as how familiar you are with, like, the culture and things like that, that's sort of why I was asking for your opinion, because, like. Because I didn't grow up that way. I mean, I grew up, I mean, I'm the first one to tell you, I mean, I, I grew up in Kansas City, so I was further away from the tribe. I always knew I was Potawatomi. I knew some of the basics, and that's mainly because I'm kind of a history buff and things like that, but I knew some of the, the basics. You know, I knew that we didn't hunt buffalo and stuff like that within the Great Lakes, but I didn't know the language. And I remember I went to a meeting that we were having, a regional meeting in uh, Kansas one year up by Rossville, and I heard this gentleman get up, uh, his name was Walter Cooper, and he, and he did a prayer in the language. And I listened to him and I was like, man, wow, you know, I'm Potawatomi and I'm really proud to be Potawatomi and I tell people all the time, but I don't know how to speak our own language. You know, I thought, and that's when I came to the realization that for me, I always, I always thought to myself, if I want to be Potawatomi, I need to be Potawatomi. So for me to be Potawatomi, I feel like I needed to learn my language. And I didn't have any unrealistic goal at the time. I just wanted to be able to like introduce myself, say a couple of words, you know, you know, go on deck ned and today, you know, I could say anything I want in Potawatomi, but that wasn't what I was trying to do then. I was just trying to learn the basics, you know, learn a little bit. And because uh, I came to the realization, like I said, that it's like if you don't know the language, it's almost like and you don't practice any traditional ways and you don't dance, you don't know anything about the tribe, are you really Potawatomi? Or are you simply a descendant of people who were Potawatomi? And it's like, I am Potawatomi. And I feel like, you know, when I get up in the morning, everything I do is Potawatomi because that's who I am. That's who, now I'm not saying that I don't have friends in German and other, you know, obviously other things running through me, but 
the Potawatomi is what I really connect with and and that's the the land you know this that's the the language of this land in a way maybe if I lived in France I'd feel more connected to my French roots you know who knows or if I lived in Germany or whatever but you know it's the language of the land it's the language of this place in a sense and so because of that I definitely feel that more of that connection to my Potawatomi ways um I kind of got lost there. <laughs> no, it's all right. That was that was great. Though. I, I think we got all the questions I was looking for. And yeah, I, I, I truly appreciate this, man. Thank you. Yeah, because my thing is I'm trying to understand that transition from sort of how we were, like how we were, how we are now, and if there is anything that we could do from here to make it better in the future. Yeah, I mean... Um, it's definitely it's a definitely a struggle in a way to to try to live in a traditional way and live in a modern world um, just because there's a lot of things that value wise that just don't add up you know like the way that we saw the earth the respect that we have for nature the respect that we have for all living things you know we didn't take more than we needed you know this is a society that's take 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 you know it's it's hoard 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 you know get as much as you can to, to be damned whoever else you know and it was like, you know, you gave away things and you um, and you cared for one another and you had relationships and connections to one another, not just to the earth, but to your relatives and things like that. And so a lot of our ideals, they don't mesh uh, respect for elders. I mean, today's modern society says, hey, you're old, you're infirm, you're in our way, get rid of you, put you in a home, send you away, get you out of the way, you know, hurry up and just get out of here. You know, you're, you're, you're a burden to me, basically. Well, our elders were the ones that kept that knowledge that had this information, this wisdom, this guidance that they could offer us, you know. So, um, it's a lot of our traditional ways of thinking about the world, and it's you you understand it more and more the more the language you start to understand. Um, it, it is a conflict sometimes in a day-to-day -day life to try to live, uh, like people say, kind of in two worlds, if you will. But um, I can say from my own perspective with learning the language, it was definitely something I would never regret having started and, and to where I am today. I never thought it would take me to where I am today, uh, the point that I'm at today, but um, it's definitely a worthwhile investment of one's time. And then I think that also one thing that I would encourage others to do also is to go to not only the, our own festivals that we have, but there's also a Potawatomi gathering where all the seven groups in the U.S. and the two in Canada, they get together every year. Obviously, it didn't happen this year. Um, but I've actually haven't missed one in 20 years. I've went to one in 2000. And I, uh, well, I guess I missed one this year. So night. Well, 20. Yeah, so 19. No, no, actually, there was 20 because 2001. Yeah. Anyway, about 20 years ish. Um, I haven't missed one. You make these connections again with people from other communities, and you learn about things from them, and you and you really gain that sense of deeper sense of identity in in being Potawatomi, uh, and. And also in just your Indianness in general, I think that's something that a lot of our, our own members maybe uh, struggle with sometimes is they look around and they see this tribe over here that maybe enrolls at a fourth and this tribe that enrolls maybe at a half. And they're like, man, am I Indian enough to be a part of this? I hear that all the time. People will call up and they'll be like, hey, I'm only, I don't know, an eighth or whatever, or whatever, six. I'm right about an eighth right now, I think, between you know, an eighth and a quarter. But that's the thing, is it's such, a, it's such a mess. How much do you even know you it, are? And it does, but it does, and that's just, it doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't matter like that. And, but like I said, so a lot of times with people down here, a lot of times you almost have to let them know it's okay to be Indian. And part of that comes with getting involved in Indian, Indianness in general. Do you know what I mean? Like wherever you live, you can get involved in the Indian community there, whether it be the Indian center, or you want to dance, or you want to partake in, maybe they have you know, fry bread cooking, or maybe they have a, a drum group. Like when I was in college, I was on a, a drum group, an intertribal drum group with different tribes. Um, so, you know, you can get connected in that way and be involved in, in that, I guess, finding your Indianness, and then uniquely kind of tuning that into your potawatomi -ness, or your nishnabe -ness in a way. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a natural path for a, a lot of people that would, I think, help them along the way, in my opinion. But, and like I said, that can be things like going to sweats. I mean, a lot of different tribes sweat. A lot of different tribes, you know, do different types of seasonal feasts and things like that. And you can participate sometimes, depending on the community you live in, 
uh, depending on how open that tribe or group happens to be that you're around, you know, participate with them or, um, you know, I guess, like I said, in that Indian community that's around you and then kind of take that and, and grow with that to where you have more of a sense of identity. Um, because that's, and that's where I think the language really helps. It really helps cement that sense of identity in who you are and, you know, and then maybe getting an Indian name and participating in ceremony and, you know, and you really feel more of a sense of ownership of it. Um, but a lot of people, like I said, they, we live in a now, now type society and people want this, they kind of want it right now. You know, like they're hungry, they're interested. This is their moment in time. They want it all right now. I had a lady on Facebook that messaged me or maybe she said in a group, I can't remember, but she was like, you know, it'd be great if we had like a manual like this is how like somebody who doesn't really know much about the tribe who's not engaged in the tribe, kind of how you go kind of the, a roadmap, if you will. And on face value, you know, that seems like a really nice, neat idea. And, and but then you start to think about it some more and you realize it's it's not that simple. It's more like everybody's journey is a little different, you know, and each and the things that you're interested in may not be the things that I'm interested in or this person's interested in. There's different ways to connect in with your your culture and your and your understanding of your traditional ways and history and everybody's paths a little bit different and it's not it's not so cut and dry you can't just put it in a book and then be like here's your manual read it to page you know 95 and you're good to go you got your potawatomi ness you're as potawatomi as there can be no it's it's about a lifetime it's a lifetime experience you know accepting who you are and saying hey nishnabendao i'm indian bodewad mean dao i'm potawatomi and then learning more about it and each step of the way, each connection, each elder you talk to or person you talk to or relationship you form or family members that you engage with. You just learn little bits more and more each each day, if you will. And it's not a it's not a speedy, speedy thing. Sometimes it might take you 20 years, it might take you 10 years, it might take you five. You might know everything you want to know in two years, one year, whatever. But it's not like it's not like you can just be like, bam, there you go. It's not that easy. And a lot of people, they don't have that patience because, again, this is the kind of society we're in. It's a now, 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 me. And, or why can't I have it? Well, you can't have it because you're not ready for it. <laughs> you know, some things you can tell people and you can't tell them because it's too much for them. Like you can't just like I could just blow your mind and like spend like three hours talking to you about the language and you just want to quit and never want to come back. Or I can give it to you in bits and pieces and you take it and you learn and you keep moving on. It's like that with the culture though. I can't just I can't just fire hose you with the culture and then like half an hour or two days or whatever, and now you're you've got it all, you're good to go. I mean, I can definitely introduce you to it. And that's kind of like a, a thing that happens though as being part of a community, you know. Like people sometimes will contact me and they'll ask about songs, like songs they can sing in a sweat lodge. Or or they'll ask about sweating. Well, you know, I can tell you that a sweat is like a sauna, but that's not really it. You know what I mean? Or I can it's say not a it's relaxing like a thing. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Or, but I can try to put it in terms that you might understand. Or it's like, it's like going to church, but in a dark place and there's rocks and they pour water. And I can try to explain this to you, but you don't really know it till you experience it. And that's kind of the way culture is too, I feel. You don't really know it until you experience it. And I can't, I can't just put that in a manual or, or explain to somebody that real easy, like, unless you just live it pretty much. So I'm rambling now, so I'll just stop. Oh, it's all right. Well, again, I want to say I really, really appreciated this. I'll let you go because I think this is way more than a half an hour or like 10 minutes. I think I asked you for like 10 minutes originally. It's been like half an hour or more. So I really appreciate this. Thank you so much.